Good afternoon. Uh, we actually don't have anything at the top today beyond, I hope you all had a good weekend. Happy Monday. Um, and with that, um, Matt. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm kind of a little bit surprised you don't have anything to say because I don't think you have said anything. Uh, sorry, let me just turn my recorder on here. Um, <clears throat> about the um, agreement that was reached yesterday in Tehran between mm -hmm. the IAEA and uh and Iran. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, do you think that this is a good thing, uh, what was agreed to? Uh, and if so, why? Well, Matt, thanks for the question. Uh, first, we do commend the professionalism that the IAEA has shown in its efforts to engage Iran uh, on maintaining the necessary cooperation to verify Iran's nuclear program in light of Tehran's announcement that it will cease implementation of the additional protocol. Uh, and JCPOA verification measures on February 23rd. Uh, we are, of course, concerned to hear that Iran intends to cease implementation of the additional protocol and other measures this week. Uh, we note the announcement that Iran will continue to implement its obligations under its comprehensive safeguards agreements with the IAEA, uh, fully and without lim limitation. Uh, and that the IAEA and Iran uh, have reached a temporary bilateral technical understanding regarding verification and monitoring activities. We fully support uh, the IAEA Director General's efforts to, to this end, uh, while also reiterating the call on Iran to fully meet its verification and other nuclear nonproliferation commitments. Okay, but um, so since you um, took the steps that you did uh, last week, you uh, mm -hmm. revoked the snapback uh, provision, you rescinded the restrictions or most of the restrictions on Iranian diplomats at the UN. You said well, that they're you still would, under restrictions, but yes. yeah, but mo the most onerous ones. You have said that you're ready to go back to the um, P5 plus one mm -hmm. table. Uh, you also revoked the FTO designation of the Houthis, an Iranian proxy, I think you'll accept, um, and you removed the Houthi leaders from the, their terrorism designation. Have things gone forward? Have things gone in the direction that the administration wants since uh, those things, since you, you have done those things, or have the Iranians not responded to these and I won't use the word, but some people have used the word concessions. Um, I'm glad you're the, not using the word. Have, have, some people have, um, have. Have the Iranians responded to these things uh, in the way that you would have liked? Matt, I think as a general matter, um, and we have been clear, Iran will never obtain a nuclear weapon. President Biden has been unequivocal on that. Uh, we are, of, co of course, going back to what I was saying just a moment ago, concerned uh, that Iran uh, has moved further away from compliance with its nuclear commitments. Um, this, of course, has been the case uh, since the last administration pulled out of the JCPOA. Uh, that is precisely why, and you heard us say this last week, I guess it was last Thursday now, uh, that we are prepared uh, to uh, meet with the Iranians in the context of the P5 plus one. Uh, to start to undertake this diplomacy, uh, to start to undertake these talks, to move forward with the proposition that has been on the table for some time now, um, a proposition that predates this administration when then candidate Biden made clear um, the deal of compliance for compliance. If Iran returns to full compliance with the Iran deal, the United States would be prepared to do the same. We would then use uh, the JCPOA as a basis uh, for a longer and stronger agreement and negotiate follow-on agreements to cover other areas of concern, including Iran's ballistic missile program. I don't think we're measuring this in minutes or hours, Matt. We are measuring this uh, in terms of uh, 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 looking forward. Um, and the Iranians know that we are prepared uh, to undertake these discussions. Uh, we made that offer uh, in the context of uh, working in lockstep with our European allies and our closest partners. I made the point last week that there was a lot of attention paid to the very short statement we issued from here in my name regarding our willingness to undertake, in these, to undertake these discussions with Iran. But in some ways, the much more significant, much more momentous element we released that day was the joint statement that emanated from Secretary Blinken's participation in the meeting with the EU3. For the first time in 
quite a long time. Uh, the United States is not working at cross purposes with our European allies. We are, in fact, uh, working together. Uh, this consultation, the consultation that took place uh, with Secretary Blinken and our uh, European allies, uh, there was a joint statement, and that joint statement made clear uh, that we see this challenge uh, uh, through um, uh, through the same lens, uh, and that we are going to approach it in the same way, and we're going to approach it together. Um, and so I think if this does come to fruition, the talks with Iran in the P5 plus one context, we will of course be there with our European allies, uh, and we will be there to undertake uh, the hard diplomacy, the discussions that can lead us to that point where Iran can resume full compliance, and the United States would be prepared to do the has, same. Has there been any movement on that? I don't believe there's been any response, any formal response from the Iranians. Yes, yeah. Mara. Um, Ned, I'm sure you've seen Hamane's comments about um, it won't be limited to 20% enrichment, it might go up to 60%. Obviously, they're not there, and one can say that this is posturing. But what is your view of those comments? Does that kind of rhetoric uh, concern you? Well, I think I would reiterate what I said before. We are, of course, concerned that Iran has, over time, moved away from its commitments under the JCPOA. This, of course, started long before this administration, uh, and in fact started under the last administration, uh, when the last administration left the JCPOA. That said, there is now a proposition on the table. There is a broad proposition at play. Uh, if Iran returns to full compliance, we will prepare, be prepared to do the same with the caveats that I noted before. Um, but there's also a specific proposition on the table. The United States will be willing to engage the Iranians in the context of the P5 plus one. So rather than posture from this podium, I, I think we are going to reiterate the proposition that is on the table. Uh, we certainly hope the Iranians um, will be willing to um, be there um, uh, because we believe that uh, together uh, in the P5 plus one context, that is where we can make progress on these difficult issues and questions that remain. And then um, on the same thing, so this kind of rhetoric makes everyone think that they're going to take quite a hard line. Is there any plan or is there any consideration on the side of U.S. perhaps to provide some goodwill gestures that could be like um, the IMF loan or the European credit uh, facility? Um, any consideration towards making any of those? I think what we have said still stands. The United States is willing to meet with the Iranians in the context of the P5 plus one. There is a lot that would still need to be worked out. This is a broad proposition uh, that is on the table, shorthand being compliance for compliance. Uh, it is complicated. It's complex. Uh, the way in which we get there is what we would want to discuss uh, in the context of that P5 plus one discussion. Yeah, Michelle. But, but don't you have any comment or reaction to Khamenei's statements when he said that uh, Iran could boost uranium enrichment to 60 percent? And uh, any reaction to the attack on the uh, American embassy today after Erbil attack last week? My comment is precisely what I told um, your colleague Matt and, and Humaira. Uh, that over time, we, of course, are concerned by the steps Iran has taken to move away from its compliance with the JCPOA. In this case, uh, this is what sounds like a threat. Um, we are not going to respond in specific terms to uh, hypotheticals, to posturing. What we are going to do is to reaffirm the proposition that is on the table. The United States is willing to meet with the Iranians to hash out these difficult, complex questions how we get to this end goal of compliance for compliance and compliance for compliance plus, uh, meaning how we use the JCPOA as a platform uh, to both lengthen and strengthen the JCPOA itself, um, but then to use it as a platform to address Iran's broader malign activities. So we're not going to respond to um, hypotheticals uh, when um, uh, in that context. Uh, we've seen the reports of uh, the, the rocket fire uh, today, uh, we have, as you heard us say in the aftermath of the tragic attack in Erbil, um, we are outraged uh, by the recent attacks. And the attack in Erbil, of course, uh, harmed civilians and coalition forces, uh, including an American service member. As you have heard me say many times before, ensuring the safety and the welfare and the health of our personnel and citizens uh, and the security of our facility, uh, we have no higher priority 
Uh, the Iraqi people have suffered for far too long from this kind of violence uh, and this violation of their sovereignty. When it comes to the attack in Erbil, I would just add that we are still determining precise attribution. Uh, but we have stated before that uh, we will hold Iran responsible for the actions of its proxies that attack Americans. Uh, it is, it, it, I can add that the rockets fired in recent attacks on uh, the coalition and citizens of Iraq, uh, including uh, this, uh, this attack I referenced, are Iranian, Iranian made and Iranian supplied. Uh, when it comes to our response, we will respond in a way that's calculated um, within our own timetable and using a mix of, of tools uh, at a time and places of, of our choosing, as you've heard me say before. Uh, what we will not do uh, is uh, lash out and risk an escalation that plays into the hands of Iran uh, and can, contributes to their attempts to further destabilize Iraq. Uh, you have also heard me say that any response will be done in coordination uh, with our Iraqi partners uh, and in coordination with the coalition as well. And do, do you have any, any update on the investigation? I, no specific updates. I think broadly what we have said is that we will hold Iran responsible by the attacks, by the provocations of its proxies. Uh, we know that many of these attacks have used Iranian-made, uh, uh, Iranian-supplied uh, weapons. Um, but uh, this is something that remains under active investigation I'm sorry, by... I thought you had said that this yeah. one did. Yeah. Uh, I, have you determined that the, the, the rockets were Iranian? And, and which one are you talking about, today's or the Erbil? No, nope. uh, I'm saying that, uh, broadly speaking, we have seen that many of these attacks have used Iranian-made, Iranian-supplied weaponry. The I wouldn't want to get ahead of the investigation. Can I stay on yes, Iran? Uh, staying on Iran for, yeah. for one moment. Um, the uh, Fakir Namazi... Um, was uh, the, the Iranian courts dropped a, his case or commuted his sentence a, over a, a year ago, and he still hasn't been allowed to leave the country. I wonder if you have any specific um, comment on that. And also, the Iranians have denied that they're in talks with you about hostage uh, swaps. So I wonder if, um, if you can just clarify, are these direct or indirect discussions? Well, I understand that our special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, uh, Ambassador Carstens, uh, issued a message uh, this morning. Today, I believe, is five years uh, since the uh, elder Mr. Namazi um, has been uh, in Iran. Uh, you also heard National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan issue a very strong message uh, to the Iranians yesterday. Um, what he said was, uh, we will not accept a long-term proposition where Iran continues to hold Americans in an unjust and unlawful manner. Uh, it will be a significant priority of this administration uh, to get those Americans uh, back home safely. As Jake, uh, the National Security Advisor Sullivan, also said yesterday, uh, we have channels to communicate with the Iranians about uh, the unjust, unlawful detention of American citizens uh, in Iran, uh, and we are using them. Uh, I wouldn't want to go beyond that, however. Uh, uh, Nord Stream 2. Uh, some of us read over the weekend about the report that went from the State Department to, to Congress not uh, sanctioning or, or, or identifying for sanctioning any other uh, entities involved in Nord Stream 2. On Friday, you mentioned the possibility without confirming of private discussions uh, about Nord Stream 2. Would those be negotiations among two more democracies about whether the pipeline can go forward? Uh, is the State Department taking the lead or is it another branch of? Um, the executive branch, and then what are the overall parameters of those talks, and is Ukraine included? Well, let me just say broadly, uh, we have said across every challenge and opportunity we face uh, that we will take them on in close coordination and consultation with our allies uh, and partners. So I think it is fair to say that nothing we would do uh, in this context would take our close allies and partners uh, by surprise. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background, um, because I know we haven't been able to go into this before. Um, so I do want to give a little bit of background on uh, the report you mentioned. Uh, so on Friday, as you alluded to, uh, the department did submit a report to Congress on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project, as required uh, by the Protecting Europe's Energy Security Act, or PISA, uh, as amended. Uh, Very late Friday, <laughs> But it was still Friday. <laughs> yeah, it was. For some but, of us, you know, yeah. For, okay. yeah. Um, this is a report for Congress. I, I know we're uh, um, there's there's to stay up and work. There's there's intense interest. 
Uh, in the report, uh, the United States identified Russia-based KVT Rus as an entity knowingly uh, selling, leasing, or providing the vessel Fortuna uh, for the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. The department determined uh, that the vessel Fortuna was engaged in pipe laying or pipe laying activities at depths of 100 feet or more uh, for the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline during the relevant time period. Pursuant to PISA, as amended, KVT Rus uh, is therefore subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, the report also uh, includes a list of entities that have engaged in good faith efforts to wind down activities related to the Nord Stream 2 project during the relevant time period and therefore are not subject to U.S. sanctions at this time. Uh, this is a list that includes over 15 entities uh, and it demonstrates that the legislative goals uh, and our actions are having a good effect. Uh, we continue to examine entities involved uh, in potentially sanctionable activity. Uh, we have been clear that companies risk sanctions if they are involved in Nord Stream 2. Uh, and this gets to your question. In, in the initial weeks of, the, of this administration, we conducted this assessment, uh, we consulted with our European allies and partners, and we delivered this report to Congress on Friday, as I said. Are there more talks going on? And is Ukraine involved in those talks on Nord Stream 2, since that would be the primary transit country that the gas would go so through? So, of course, energy security uh, is a uh, constant topic of discussion uh, with our closest allies and partners. Uh, I wouldn't want to detail or read out uh, any of those beyond that we've already uh, spoken to. Um, but again, uh, when it comes to our allies and partners, it is fair to say that they would not be taken by surprise in any action we would take, nor would they be surprised by any approach uh, or strategy we are taking to um, this uh, issue broadly, whether it's Nord Stream 2 or energy security uh, across the board. Uh, yeah, in the back. On Iran, uh, some reports indicate that there is an appeal now from the Biden administration about uh, Iran's foreign minister's suggestion of synchronized approach. Uh, is this something now the U.S. government would consider? And also on Yemen, the special envoy to Yemen will travel today to the region mm -hmm. and State Department statement said uh, he's going to uh, travel to the Gulf countries, some Gulf countries. Can you, be, can you give us specifics about which countries he will uh, visit uh, during this uh, travel? And what has been changed since last visit? that would bring him back to the region? Let me start with your second question first. Uh, and we did put out a media note just a little bit ago. Um, but as that announcement says, U.S. Special Envoy Linder King is traveling to several Gulf countries this week. Uh, he will be meeting with senior government officials in the region, as well as with the U.N. Uh, Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths. Uh, U.S. Special Envoy Linder King's discussions will focus on uh, our dual track approach to end the war in Yemen, a lasting political solution to the conflict and humanitarian relief uh, for the Yemeni people. Uh, as we have spoken about um, from this podium and as you heard, uh, Special Envoy Linder King, it was uh, last week now, we see this as an urgent priority. Um, it is urgent for the humanitarian implications, for the security implications, for uh, the geopolitical and geostrategic uh, implications of uh, this conflict in Yemen. And that is precisely why uh, that early on in his presidency, President Biden appointed uh, a career official, um, Special Envoy, now Special Envoy Linder King, uh, to take on this role, to prioritize the diplomatic approach. You're right that Special Envoy Linder King was in Saudi Arabia a week before last, I, I guess it now was. Um, but I think this just shows uh, the urgency with which we are uh, approaching this challenge, the fact that he is uh, returning uh, to the Gulf uh, this week. When it comes to Iran and, and what uh, the foreign minister uh, may have said, I think our response will be very similar to what I've told your colleagues. Uh, we're not looking to posture from podiums. We are looking to engage in discussions um, and to start those discussions in the construct of the P5 plus one, precisely what we announced last week now, uh, that the United States would be willing to meet with the Iranians in the context of uh, the P5 plus one. Again, having reached that conclusion, uh, following Secretary Blinken's meeting with his E3 counterparts, and after weeks, several weeks, of close consultations uh, with our 
allies, including our European allies, with our partners, uh, and of course, with members of Congress. Yeah, hasn't the situation in Yemen gotten demonstrably worse over the course of the last Matt, the, 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 situ the situation. Well, hasn't it not, forget about, I'm not trying to make, draw any cause, causal link. Hasn't the situation gotten worse? Is that your understanding? The situation in Yemen has been heartbreaking. It has been tragic uh, for years now. I wouldn't want to measure it again uh, on the basis of hours uh, or even days. Uh, what we are looking to do is to bring an end uh, to this conflict in Yemen, Yemen now being home to the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe, uh, to bring relief to the long-suffering uh, people of Yemen, and uh, to put an end, um, or at least to uh, diminish uh, the humanitarian plight under which they live. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe let's, we've done a lot on Iran. Maybe let's move around. Uh, Lalit? Thank you. I wanted to ask you about uh, India-China disengagement. The two countries has completed their disengagement, one part of the border territory in Leh and Ladakh. Do you have any comments on that? How do you see the development? Well, we are closely following reports of troop disengagement. Uh, we welcome the ongoing efforts to de-escalate the situation. We will, of course, continue to monitor the situation closely as both sides work towards a peaceful resolution. Do you, do you think uh, China should withdraw its troops from the rest, other part of the part of the border where it has encroached upon in recent months? We're continuing to monitor the situation. Uh, we certainly uh, welcome uh, the reports of de-escalation, um, uh, and we're fl closely following those initial reports of troop disengagement. Uh, one more India question mm -hmm. about the COVID-19 vaccines. Mm -hmm. In recent months and weeks, India has supplied or donated uh, COVID vaccines to several countries, in fact, dozens of them. The last one landed in today in Mongolia. How do you see that India offering its uh, vaccines to other countries where people need it very badly? And is there any scope for cooperation between India and the U.S. on coronavirus pandemic and which areas they are? When it comes to the broad issue of coordination between the United States and India on COVID-19, I would say that cooperation uh, between our two countries builds on decades of successful partnership uh, in health and biomedical research. Uh, we are partnering to strengthen the global response to COVID-19 uh, on issues ranging from addressing infectious disease outbreaks to strengthening health systems to securing uh, global supply chains. Uh, the United States and India recently welcomed an initiative to collaborate uh, through an international center of excellence and research focused on infectious disease, uh, including COVID-19 and other emerging threats. Uh, we look forward to an overarching MOU to enhance health cooperation uh, between our two countries. We are working together on developing diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines to combat uh, the disease and to recognize the importance of manufacturing critical drugs during this time uh, and making them accessible uh, globally. India's pharmaceutical sector is strong and well-established and has long played a central role in manufacturing life-saving vaccines for global use. We are pleased that the U.S. pharmaceutical industry uh, has been coordinating with Indian companies since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, yes? This is on the Quad. Uh, how does the U.S. see the Quad succeed? Will it see India and U.S. Uh, work together using force or tactics that sit uh, above or slightly below an armed conflict to keep a fair and free Indo-Pacific? And also, uh, the ch um, a top Chinese diplomat said that the United States and China could work together to is uh, on issues like climate change and coronavirus. Uh, if the damage has been, uh, you know, ironed out, is there anything on that uh, initiated? When it comes to the Quad, and I think you've heard me say this before, but uh, it's, it bears repeating, uh, it's an example of the United States and some of our closest partners pulling together for the good of a free and open Indo-Pacific. We view the Quad as having essential momentum and important potential, uh, so we'll build on it by deepening cooperation on areas of traditional focus. Uh, that includes maritime security, uh, while also working closely with Quad partners to confront some of the defining challenges and even opportunities of our time. That includes COVID-19, it includes climate, and includes uh, democratic resilience. Of course, Secretary Blinken had the opportunity last week, now it was, uh, to confer um, uh, for the first time with his uh, Quad counterparts. I suspect uh, you will be seeing Secretary Blinken uh, be uh, continue to do that uh, in the weeks and months ahead, um, given the central role of the Quad uh, going, uh, going forward. Uh, remind me of your first question. Uh, on China, uh, working with the U.S., uh, ironing out any issues in the in the coming days. Right. Um, look, I, I think uh, you're referring to State Councilor uh, Wang Yi's uh, comments. Yeah. 
I, I think his comments reflect a continued pattern uh, of Beijing's tendency to uh, avert blame uh, for its predatory economic practices, its lack of transparency, its failure to honor its international agreements, uh, and its repression of uh, universal human rights. We'll continue to stand up for our democratic values uh, when human rights are being violated in Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, or elsewhere in China, uh, or when uh, autonomy is being trampled uh, in Hong Kong. You've heard us speak before about the way in which we will approach China uh, uh, and uh, China through the prism of competition uh, from a position of strength. And, and again, you have heard me say in this briefing that we will work closely with our allies and partners across the board. That's precisely what we're doing uh, with the Quad. It's precisely what we're doing uh, with our allies uh, and partners in Europe. It's precisely what we're doing with our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific uh, to approach China from a position of strength. Yes. So, in this poll from Deutsche Welle, this is a question uh, regarding China and Germany. So, uh, Germany has not yet made a final decision on whether to exclude Huawei from its critical 5G infrastructure. Does the State Department think that Angela Merkel, our Chancellor, should block Huawei? Well, I think what is true is that there has been a, a rather frequent dialogue um, on the security challenges uh, and the technological challenges uh, that uh, China poses. Uh, we know that, uh, especially when it comes to countries um, with whom we have a close uh, alliance or partnership, and of, of course um, that includes Germany, that we have to confront uh, this challenge together, uh, China's abuse. Um, uh, China's predatory uh, practices, um, China's uh, export of uh, uh, tools it uses to further uh, it, its um, brand of uh, uh, techno-authoritarianism. Um, it is something we are working very closely with our partners uh, and allies, and that includes China, uh, Germany. But what exactly does that mean when it comes to the 5G uh, infrastructural uh, rollout in Germany? If Huawei would be uh, in the game, what would that mean? Well, uh, we advocate for a vibrant digital economy worldwide uh, that enables all citizens uh, to benefit from the promise of 5G networks. Um, but to get to what I was saying before, um, the stakes for securing these networks could not be higher. Um, 5G is transformative. It will touch every aspect of our lives, including critical infrastructure. Um, uh, and it's something that, of course, we are discussing uh, very much with our um, partners uh, and allies. We're deeply concerned about the dangers of installing networks uh, with equipment that can be manipulated, disrupted, or controlled uh, by the PRC, uh, which, as I was alluding to before, has, has no conception of uh, privacy uh, or even human rights uh, in, in that extent. So uh, it will be a continued area of discussion and cooperation. Yes. Yeah, uh, on the Western Sahara, any update on uh, the review that you're making towards the policy there? No, no, no update uh, for you um, at the moment. Um, I, I think what we have said broadly still applies. We welcome uh, the new steps Morocco is taking to improve relations with Israel. The Morocco-Israel relationship uh, will have long-term benefits for both countries. We will continue to support uh, the UN process to implement a just and lasting solution to this long-standing uh, dispute, the dispute in Morocco. We'll also support the work of the mission of the United Nations for the referendum uh, in Western Sahara uh, to, the, to monitor the ceasefire and to prevent violence in the area. Uh, sorry, you said you would support the, the process. The, 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 uh, the UN process. The UN, well, yeah, but the UN process leading to a plebiscite? No, I said we, we will support the work of the mission. Um, well, does, does that mean that you don't recognize uh, the Western Sahara area as a part of Morocco? It means I don't have any updates for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, follow up on Nordstein, too. Yes. So you said you had consulted with your allies ahead of the report, mm -hmm. but uh, does it concern you at all that Ukrainian and Polish foreign ministers wrote an op-ed calling for further action? Um, and what is your response to Republicans who say this just doesn't go far enough to actually halt the pi pipeline? Well, uh, I think I said before that we will continue to monitor uh, activity that could lead to uh, additional penalties, including sanctions. But I think it would be wrong to uh, think of sanctions as the only tool um, in, our, in our toolbox here. Um, but the other element that I would stress, and, and I said this earlier, 
um, is that, yes, uh, we did uh, announce the uh, designation of KVT Roos. Um, but the part I don't want to get buried is that the report that we sent to Congress last Friday also includes a list uh, of entities that have engaged in good faith efforts to wind down activities related to Nord Stream 2 uh, during this relevant time period. Of course, uh, those entities are not subject to U.S. sanctions precisely because they have taken these good faith uh, steps, steps in the right direction. There are 15, uh, there are over 15 uh, of them, and I think that demonstrates uh, that our strategy, including the legislative strategy, the strategy that, of course, Congress um, is, um, uh, has been behind, um, has been working to good effect. So we'll continue to work closely with Germany. We'll continue to work closely uh, with our other allies and partners uh, in Europe to uphold Europe's own stated uh, energy security goals. So is the, it's a bit disingenuous to claim credit for the 18 companies winding down. All of this work was done under the previous administration. Matt, you I'm guys not, have only been in month for, Matt, I mean, only been in office for a month, I, right? Are you telling me that in the last Matt, four I'm, weeks, these 18 companies all of a sudden decide to say, oh, my God, we better not do Matt, anything with I am. I am too. speaking for the all United. Of that, I am taking, speaking. You guys are taking credit for stuff that the Matt, previous administration Matt, did. Right? I, I, I am not. No? I am yes speaking no? for the Department of State. OK. The people right. who have been working this, okay. the people who are working this now, were the same people a month ago, were the same people. Three months ago? Three four months, months ago. ago. So okay. I. All right. So I just don't just, I just, one following up on that. So the administration is committed to ensuring that that pipeline is not completed. Our position on this has not changed. To Matt's point, we have the same position that the previous administration had. It is a bad deal. It is bad for Europe. It is in contravention of Europe's own stated energy goals. Is it a bad commercial deal or a bad geopolitical deal or a moral deal? We're, we're talking in terms of geopolitics. I, I think we are, we are concerned um, about the influence that it would allow Russia uh, and the leverage uh, that it would give um, the Russian regime over some of our closest allies and partners in Europe. Um, anyone who hasn't asked a question, um, have you, Kylie? No. no. Um, I just am curious, uh, we're, what, like two months away from the deadline, essentially, for all of American troops to have to leave Afghanistan. Um, is the administration confident that you guys can negotiate an extension of that withdrawal uh, deadline if that's the direction that you need to go in? Um, because it's it's not that long until that deadline is upon us. Well, you mentioned one possible outcome, but I would just stress uh, that we are still very much uh, reviewing uh, what has been agreed to. Uh, I think it would be wrong for anyone to presuppose uh, the outcome of that review at this point. Um, we haven't completed that review. It's ongoing. Uh, but what we have concluded uh, is that the best way to advance our shared interests is to press all parties uh, to advance our uh, uh, to to reach full and timely compliance with all of their commitments in the U.S. Taliban agreement and the U U.S. Afghanistan uh, joint declaration. Uh, you have heard me say uh, in recent days here that the levels of violence in Afghanistan they are unacceptably high. Uh, we are troubled by indications that violence may increase further. Uh, the Afghan people want and deserve peace, uh, and that is precisely what we are evaluating, how best um, to bring that peace, that stability, that prosperity to the people of Afghanistan through a just, through a durable, uh, negotiated political solution to this long-running conflict. Okay, and I have one follow-up on Iran. I know you felt we... Um, did that, but I'm curious what you're calling this is a temporary bilateral technical understanding reached by the IAEA and Iran over the weekend. So from your perspective, is there any significant access to verifying or monitoring Iran's nuclear program that's going to be denied over the next three months, or is it all there? I would refer you to the IAEA for its uh, assessment of this deal. Um, what we have said is that we commend the professionalism of the IAEA. We fully support the Director General uh, in his uh, efforts to this end. Uh, the IAEA Director General is a true professional, a true expert. Um, he obviously uh, spoke to the press over the weekend, uh, sounded confident in the arrangement that um, he had been able to reach with the Iranian regime. But um, I would refer you to the international weapons inspectors in the form of the IAEA in this regard. Has the State Department gotten a detailed readout of the trip yet? I, I don't know. We'll let you know if there have been any uh, consultations with the IAEA since the, since the visit concluded. 
Anything else? Okay. Uh, yes, in the back. Yes, thank you. Um, you all have been saying that corruption, the fight against corruption, is at the heart of your Central America policy, emerging mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen you denouncing specific elected leaders like the most corrupt president in in uh, the hemisphere. <laughs> do is that something that would be appropriate for the State Department to do? Would you do it? Would you designate him a a, a kingpin if, if that were seen as the as the appropriate step? I'm just trying to gauge what you guys are willing to do, how public you're willing to denounce the yeah, leaders. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was I was going to say should I should I ask who precisely you're referring to? <laughs> Orlando Hernandez. Look, um, we, we have spoken about the role of corruption in the region in both uh, South America. You've heard me refer to the Maduro regime, and we have talked about it in the context of uh, Central America. Um, and recently, we have spoken of Central America in terms of the drivers for the irregular migration uh, that have uh, driven so many uh, desperate individuals from this region uh, to undertake that dangerous journey north, a, a journey that is made even more dangerous at the moment uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We understand that if we are going to uh, bring about um, a, a more stable um, uh, hemisphere in terms of migration, if we are going to address uh, those root causes, that we can't let rife corruption go unchecked. Uh, so we will be vocal, we will support, we will continue to support anti-corruption efforts uh, in the region, knowing that it is in the interests uh, of the people of uh, the Northern Triangle of Central America more broadly, but uh, it is also um, pr profoundly um, consistent with our values, but also our interests, given uh, the migratory pressure that I spoke to before. Okay, good goals, but you're willing to denounce Maduro by name, but not Hernandez by name? I, I'm trying to understand that. Uh, no, uh, we have spoken, as I have said, uh, about, about corruption, uh, including in uh, the Northern Triangle. Um, I, 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 we are not shying away from denouncing uh, any particular leader. Um, we are rooting out corruption wherever it exists, whether that's uh, seeking to root out, I should say, corruption wherever it exists, whether that's in the Western Hemisphere uh, or more broadly. Um, yes. On Turkey, any, uh, anything new regarding the talks with Turkey regarding the S-400 and the F-35? Uh, no, um, and that's precisely because our uh, uh, position on the S-400 has not changed. Um, uh, and so I, I don't have any updates uh, for you there. Jumaira. Um Two quick ones. Uh, on Yemen, next week, there's going to be a donor conference. They're trying to uh, raise like $4 billion. Last time, it had only, um, they had only received half of what it was needed, and there was a big gap from the Gulf allies. How much will the U.S. pledge? And are you asking Saudi Arabia and UAE to make generous donations? And since I'm at it, um, on Myanmar, why aren't you guys um, sanctioning the military uh, companies already? Because, I mean, all of these people are taking to the streets, they're demonstrating, they're carrying out a strike. In terms of, like, the economic damage that's already being out there, um, wouldn't it be, like, um, wouldn't it demonstrate U.S. support for these people if you would take that step and impose sanctions on Nakamura? Well, well, we we have taken the step of imposing yeah. sanctions on the military, on military associated en entities. We designated both people and entities uh, just days after we determined this to be a coup. Not uh, the actual companies, not not Nakamura. Well, I, I, I said people and entities. Um, the other point I would make is that uh, there may be additional policy levers we can pull uh, when it comes to uh, our goal of uh, supporting the people of Burma, of uh, putting pressure on, the, on those behind this military coup uh, in order to restore democratically elected governance uh, to Burma. We, of course, as I think you saw late last week, applauded the sanctions that were imposed uh, by the Brits, uh, by the Canadians. We have been working uh, with our closest allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, in North America, in Europe, on this as well. We'll continue to do so. You raised Burma, so let me just uh, say, since I have the opportunity, uh, we strongly condemn any violence by the Burmese authorities against the Burmese people, uh, including peaceful protesters, uh, and we urge the Burmese military to exercise restraint. Over the weekend, millions of Burme Burmese took to the streets to show the strength of their will and the power of their collective voice. We stand with the people of Burma. 
We call on the Burmese military to act peacefully uh, and with respect for the rule of law and human rights, including the freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly. We stand with the people of Burma and support uh, the freedom of peaceful assembly, including to protest peacefully in support of the democratically elected government. Uh, one final question. Thank you. Over the last few years, India has started importing oil and natural gas from the United States. Uh, given that the, this administration has a top priority in climate change, uh, would that continue to happen, or there's going to break on that? Are you reviewing this, your export policy on the oil and natural gas? Well, of course, we have worked closely with India on the challenge of climate change. It was just before November, uh, I guess it was December of uh, 2015, uh, when uh, the Paris Agreement was consummated, uh, that the United States and India worked especially closely uh, to usher in uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, just as we did with uh, China at that time. So we will continue to work closely with India uh, on the challenge of climate change. Uh, when it comes to energy cooperation more broadly, I would say that the U.S.-India Energy Partnership supports sustainable energy development. Uh, it harnesses energy sources to meet 21st century power needs. Uh, it protects national security and promotes regional and international stability. We collaborate on natural gas, renewable energy, nuclear energy, clean coal technologies, smart grids, and, and unconventional and clean energy sources research for the benefit of our people now and in the future. Our broad energy cooperation with India under the Strategic Energy Partnership is strong and will continue growing even as the administration prioritizes climate change issues. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we will do this again tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.